Hi. I think we're on now. I think we're live. Vanessa, you out there? And um, uh, Internet Land? Just want to double check, make sure I'm on and everything's set. It's uh, maybe 30 seconds before three. I, I don't want to get moving yet until um, we feel like more people have been able to tune in. So uh, I'm assuming I'm up and going. I haven't heard anything to the contrary. Yeah, Laney's watching. Hi, Laney. How you doing? Hey, you're doing a good job of um, of reaching people also on Zoom and what have you. I think it's great and. Uh, you know, you love the area's history, and I'm sure you're really putting out a lot of good stuff. Delighted to have you, really. Um, I'm looking outside at a Hayden mango tree, peach mango tree. The birds are chirping below us, but they're not that loud because I'm in a different room. Vanessa's on, too. Uh, Julie's on. Oh, that's great. Aaron's on. <laughs> this is great. Hey, this is wonderful. This is wonderful. It's a good way to get through this scourge. Selma, delighted to have you here. This is great. So our lesson today, uh, or our chat today, uh, deals with the communities in Northeast Miami-Dade, uh, namely Bell Harbor, Bay Harbor, Indian Creek Village, Surfside, and if time permits, et cetera, et cetera, meaning just a maybe a, a touch on um, Allison Island, and if time permits, Lagorse, and some of the other areas out there. But I I wanted to discuss uh, just very briefly at the outset to give you an idea of the dimensions of the bay. And as a little bit of background, I began to conduct tours of what we call the North Bay Tour. Uh, we kind of gussied it up and called it uh, Historic Biscayne Bay, but I've been doing it for about 30 years and it gathered a tremendous amount of stuff, clippings and studies and what have you. And um, that tour would begin at Bayside. We, we began with History Miami uh, probably about early 1990s. And it would go all the way out uh, close to the Broad Causeway. Now, I've done another tour that on a smaller boat that would leave from uh, Pelican Harbor on the 79th Street JFK Causeway and head even farther north in the bay. Uh, that part of the bay is, uh, parts of it are raw. They're just gorgeous. Uh, mangrove trees that are a couple stories in height along some of the shoreline there. So it's really a beautiful place. The bay itself, Biscayne Bay, begins to appear on Spanish maps as that, maybe named for the Bay of Biscaya, uh, part of Fran off the coast of France and northern Spain. It's uh, 39 miles in length, it's three to nine miles in width, and it's shallow in many places. Uh, of course, we have channelized it again and again, especially the Atlantic Intracoastal Waterway. So whatever we're talking about today, uh, developed early on in Miami's history as a corporate entity, um, and I just wanted to share with you some of the stories about it. When we look at our first major topic, Indian Creek Village, we really need to look very briefly at the development of Miami Shores. Miami Shores was part of what was known generically as Biscayne Country. And uh, developers came along, the Shoreland Corporation came along in 1924, bought a large tract of land. The boom was really heating up, it reached its peak the next year, 1925. And they began to survey, plat, and sell lots in 1924, and it was just explosive, the sales. They sold out everything. Opened up a new section in 25, and they, it was oversubscribed by the tune of $12 million, meaning there was $12 million in excess of what was actually there to buy. Um, and they had grandiose ideas. Uh, they designed their early homes in what we would call a Mediterranean Italian style. Uh, some of the principals in the Shoreland Corporation were also the developers of the uh, Venetian Causeway, which was up and going by 1926. And their ideas were really grandiose. In fact, I think that George Merrick really looked upon Miami Shores as his, for lack of a better term, chief rival, although he had a nice working relationship with a man named Hugh Anderson, who was a principal in Miami Shores. And in fact, they agreed that um, uh, Merrick would name a street uh, with the surname Anderson, Carl Gables, and Anderson would do the same thing with the street for George Merrick in Miami Shores. Merrick came through Anderson Avenue, uh, but the Shoreland Corporation wasn't able to. They went belly up by the late 20s and before that street was ever named. So who knows, there might be a Merrick way one of these days in Miami Shores just to make good on that promise of nearly 100 years ago. Um, so the Shoreland Corporation that developed Miami Shores said, you know, it's not enough to develop the mainland, not enough to develop the Venetian Isles. What we want to do is we want to build four large rectangular islands that will extend north from the Venetian Isles all the way up to another island uh, across the Miami Shores that you could access by what they call the Grand Concourse. And so 
uh, they designed uh, and they planned to develop um, with Italian names these four large rectangular islands connected by these large humpback bridges. And uh, the first was called uh, Sola di Lonata. It never happened, but you've seen the stakes in Biscayne Bay as you're coming off the Julia or coming east on the Julia Tuttle Causeway. You can see on your right or south those stakes in the bay, and they're nicely rectangular because that was going to be a Sola di Lonata. Never happened because the Shoreland Corporation was belly up before they could even do that. Um, now, the, the farthest most island was going to be called Miami Shores Island, and it was dredged out of Bay Bottom. It was um, about a half a mile in circumference, a few hundred acres, and um, it was dredged, uh, but there was no development there, and it was just kind of like dormant in that area for a long period of time. Um, the idea was, had that come to fruition at the time that Miami Shores was being developed, that Grand Concourse would have connected it as a sort of a big causeway, ornate, from the Miami Shores mainland out to Indian Creek, today's Indian Creek Village. Didn't happen. So a group of wealthy Midwesterners, as well as a Virginian, came along in the late 1920s with plans to develop this island. They bought it, they purchased the island, they had it surveyed, they had it platted, they created 41 home lots, each of which back to the water around a big golf course, an 18-hole golf course, and they did build um, a wonderful Mediterranean Italian style clubhouse for Indian Creek, the future Indian Creek Village. The clubhouse was designed by a man named Maurice Fascio, who was a Swiss born and educated architect. He had great success in Palm Beach during the boom. And he designed this beautiful, beautiful building. Uh, so the clubhouse was up and going by 1928, 29. Um, but the, the area itself wasn't developed until sometime after that. And when development came again, the homes would surround that and it became, as you can imagine, a very exclusive community. It was incorporated as a village connected by a two lane bridge from Surfside, which was developed actually even later than that. But it was incorporated in 1939 when Surfside was already uh, a village, or, excuse me, already a town. Um, its estimated population remains very small as of, uh, as of 2018. Uh, the estimated population was just 91, but some of the residents, uh, both in 2018 and in earlier times, included a lot of heavyweights. Norman and Norma Brayman of Brayman Motors. He once owned the Philadelphia Eagles football team. Gus Machado of car fame. Julio Iglesias, who has a couple of properties there. Marianne and the late great Don Shula. In fact, uh, with History of Miami in February, I conducted a, um, a talk at the Indian Creek Village, the Village of Indian Creek Clubhouse. And um, after the talk, uh, one of the people who had sort of set it up with us for me to come over there and give a, a presentation, uh, she said, would you like to join us for dinner? And I said, yes, I would, thank you. And we sat at a table, and she said, excuse me just a second, I want to say hello to my good friend at the next table. And it was Mary Ann Shula, so when she came back, I said, well, is Coach Shula there? She said, no, he's home tonight. And that's all she said about it. And of course, he would pass away a little less than three months later. So you had the Shulas, you had Carl Icahn, uh, the huge investor, uh, Jeffrey Sofer, a developer, among other things, Raymond Floyd, the great golfer, Spanish language TV personality, Don Francisco, and uh, the list just goes on and on and on. But again, it's a very exclusive, very interesting community. Now, a little bit of history, kind of an aside, when the clubhouse did open in 1929, um, you know, they had a dinner there and what have you, and they did bring in a, a live orchestra and a, a sort of an early version of a big band. The band leader was none other than Ozzie Nelson. Now, you have to be an old-timer like me to appreciate Ozzie Nelson. He was the absent-minded father in the TV show Ozzie and Harriet. In fact, Harriet was the singer with the band, maybe not that night, but that's how Ozzie and Harriet uh, got together as a couple. And, I mean, this was uh, sort of a a lightweight show, but it was a heavyweight show in terms of popularity way back when in the early days of television. I wanted to move to Bay Harbor. Uh, Bay Harbor sits a little bit northeast of, and uh, it um, clads both sides of what we call the Broad Causeway, and I'll explain the Broad Causeway very shortly. So think of Indian Creek Village, and then think of an area a bit northeast of it, Bay Harbor, and really the principals here are Shepherd and Ruth Broad. Uh, Shepard Broad was a Russian immigrant, um, came to the United States as a young man, became an attorney, a banker, and ultimately a developer, and 
In fact, he served uh, 26 one-year terms as mayor of, of India, excuse me, of Bay Harbor, of the, of the town of Bay Harbor. And they were great people. When I was writing my first book, A History of Mount Sinai Medical Center, back in the late 1980s, I interviewed a whole list of people who were paramount in the development of Mount Sinai. And so uh, one day I went over uh, to um, uh, Shepherd Broad's bank, and um, he had like a little uh, private room there, you know, a dining room and what have you. And uh, I interviewed him there along with his wife, Ruth, and uh, Ruth was just great. Uh, rather than have an attendant there, and there were people there working for them, uh, she served us, I thought that was so quaint, hot tea. And uh, it was just a wonderful talk. Uh, they were just two of the nicest people imaginable, as uh, is, was their son and as is their daughter. So it was a terrific family. Shepherd Broad came down here at the outset of the 40s, and he had a yen after World War II when there was another great boom, real estate boom, to develop. And he saw these uh, marshy areas, for lack of a better term, in Biscayne Bay that would later become uh, the two islands representing Bay Harbor. And he wanted to purchase them, but he really didn't have the, the cash for it. It was about $600,000. So what he did was he sold two and a half floors that he owned in the Biscayne building in downtown Miami. It's a building that's uh, really filled with attorneys. It's real close to the county courthouse on East Flagler between Miami Avenue and what would be Northwest uh, First Avenue. And so he sold that in order to come up with the money for it. And uh, what he had there was about 253 acres of essentially swamp and mangroves, a lot of which was underwater. And so through a lot of dredging that commenced in 1946-47, he developed the West Island and then um, build a bridge connecting the town, um, the future town to the mainland that was finally completed in 1951, known as the Broad Causeway. And so that made it really viable. As the West Island developed, it developed as a single family home community. The East Island, which is larger, developed uh, almost exclusively as a condominium apartment community. And the East Island is very notable for its tremendous uh, MIMO, Miami Modern, mid-century Miami Modern archi architecture. And look at the list of the architects here. Uh, Charles McCarahan, um, Mr. Lapidus, of course, of Fountain Blue fame, Norm Giller, uh, great MIMO architect, Henry Hohauser, both Art Deco and MIMO, Robert Law Weed, a man by the name of Annis, Mathis, Grossman, Fine, who did a lot of uh, design, for example, in, in um, nearby Surfside, Polovitsky, and the, name, the names go on and on and on. So some of the finest mid-century Miami architects designed those buildings in the East Island. In the last five to 10 years, developers have come into the East Island, not so much the West Island, single family homes, the East Island, and have just been salivating over the developmental opportunities. And so there's been a real tug of war between preservationists and developers in that area. I've served on the city's, excuse me, on the county's preservation board since 1997, and the most heated meetings that we've ever had have involved uh, issues dealing with um, the East Island of uh, Bay Harbor. And some of those buildings indeed have come down at the hands of developers in recent years, but it's been a tremendous tug of war. In fact, the National Trust for Historic Preservation uh, every year list the 11 most endangered places in the country in terms of threats to historic or architecturally important buildings. And um, the East Island of Bay Harbor made that list in recent years. Uh, there are roughly about uh, 5,700 plus people uh, living all together uh, on both of those islands. And of course, it's separated by the Grand Concourse, a wonderful road that runs east off of the Broad Causeway. And then there's Bal Harbor, immediately east of Bay Harbor. These things can get confusing. And Bal's interesting in how the name came, B-A-L. It's actually a, uh, a coming together, a conflation, if you will, of uh, B-A from Bal and um, uh, A-L, excuse me, B from Bal and A-L from Atlantic. Uh, and thus it's Bal Harbor and Harbor spelled H-A-R-B-O-U-R. So it's pretty fancy with some French overtones to it. Uh, as far back as 1929, and the boom is really over, and this is kind of crazy, Carl Fisher, who was really instrumental in bringing down so many heavyweights, so many industrialists, so many people in the automobile industry, and getting them involved in investments in Greater Miami, getting them involved in development in Greater Miami, had a friend, Robert Graham, who was a, a major force in the automobile industry, 
and with some help from from Carl Fisher, Graham purchased a large area that corresponds to Bell Harbor and uh, began to uh, bulk up the shoreline and uh, took steps to start developing. In 1929, well, the stock market crashed in 29. We were already in an economic depression down here, and so nothing happened. The war came along, uh, America's involvement in the war in 1941, and that area became, uh, first of all, a uh, army gunnery field that represents part of Bell Harbor today. And then by the middle of the 1940s, another German POW camp, in addition to the one just across in today's day land mall that was there at the time. Uh, so it's, it's got some very interesting stories to it. War was over, Graham, along with his son, said, hey, now it's time to develop this place. I've been sitting on it for over 15 years. And indeed, they began to build. And in 1946, Bell Harbor incorporated as a village. In 1947, it was reincorporated. And building proceeded very rapidly. Essentially, what happened was the area of Bell Harbor west of Collins Avenue would develop as a residential community, primarily single-family homes. The area east of it would develop as, first of all, a hotel area with hotels like the Seaview and the Kenilworth and a later... Um, some of the other great places, the Americana and what have you. But uh, in recent times, those hotels have maintained, the Kenilworth's been replaced by another hotel. The Seaview's still there, but now it's primarily condominiums on the east side of Collins Avenue in that area we know as Bell Harbor. Uh, probably the biggest story about Bell Harbor, of course, was the opening in 1966 of the Bell Harbor Shops by the Whitman family, a great family, he came to Miami from Chicago at the outset of the 20s. The patriarch of the family, uh, I believe it was William Whitman, would buy a lot of land on Miami Beach. He developed the first movie theater on Lincoln Road. Uh, he built a great hotel on Miami Beach on Collins Avenue, the Whitman, uh, and a lot of other investments. Um, after the war, of course, his sons kind of took over. It's a very, very interesting family, and we have a great exhibition, a permanent exhibition, on the ground floor of the North Building in History of Miami of the Whitman family's uh, nautical maritime sorts of devices like surfboards and outboard engines and things of that nature. They were very, very innovative. And uh, they opened up, uh, led by Stanley Whitman, one of the three brothers, the Battle Harbor Shops in 1966. And as Stanley later said, and I quote, only my mother believed in my plan that this would work. And indeed, it's become one of the most successful malls in the United States and one of the priciest malls in terms of renting and leasing in the United States. Um, population of Bell Harbor today, a little bit south of 3,000 persons. And then there's Surfside. This is probably about as far as we're gonna get on our, our uh, survey of communities, because I wanna leave some time for questions. Surfside is an area today that was property of the Tatum brothers, who were ubiquitous in terms of developing a Miami Grove Park, Florida City, large chunks of today's East Little Havana, parts of downtown Miami. And uh, the Tatums had purchased a bunch of land up there in uh, what today would be North Beach, or actually just beyond North Beach. And they began to plat the land. And plats, these are subdivisions, plats four, five, and six represent today's town of Surfside. Henry Levy, who was a major developer of, of, in that area too, of the Normandy Isles and uh, parts of North Beach, he also had a hand, but a much smaller hand, than did the Tatum brothers in developing the future surf site. Uh, their plants were known as Altos Del Mar. That was the name of their development. Uh, they were selling land during the boom at that time. Well, the boom collapsed, things slowed down. The future town of Surfside barely developed uh, after the boom's collapse. At the same time, a man named Alfred Barton, who was a tremendous maitre d', opened up something called the Surf Club. A glorious uh, structure. It's been fully restored as part of a Four Seasons complex today. It opened on New Year's Eve of 1930, and it became a great host and hideaway for some of the rich, famous, and beautiful. Everybody from Elizabeth Taylor to Winston Churchill, who actually painted there while he was there right after World War II. And uh, the surf club had uh, a bunch of heavyweight members, friends of Fisher's and others, and they began to push for the incorporation of the town. Now, there were rumblings that maybe the city of Miami Beach wanted to move north in the mid-1930s and annex that land that would represent the future surf side. So in 1935, with the requisite number of incorporators, the town of Surfside was created. And um, it grew pretty quickly. Now, one of the things that's very interesting is, is that the downtown, which is one of the great features of it, stretching just for a two-block area along Harding Avenue, 
from 96 down to through the end of 95th uh, developed really after World War II, but it's a very interesting downtown. It's a, it's a, it's a throwback. They had the pharmacy and uh, the uh, food fair store and a gas station. And now, of course, they have a Wells Fargo bank branch and what have you. I conduct tours of it, in fact, um, and was scheduled to do a tour during the time that we've been uh, sequestered. So uh, downtown developed nicely, but what's happened in recent years is, is the area along Collins Avenue has been redeveloped in a large way. You've got a Fendi condominium complex there. You've got the Grand Hotel there. We've mentioned the Four Seasons already. Uh, you've got other great hoteliers that have moved into that area on both sides of Collins, but especially on the ocean side. It's a community of about 6,000 residents today. It's very vibrant. There's a lot of activities for people who live there. Um, it also has some great archaeology. Uh, the first, uh, I think, significant archaeology in the area in terms of excavations and understanding of early peoples in the area really came in the southwestern parts of Surfside uh, with a large Indian burial mound excavated in 1923 and other parts of that area excavated in 1924, some of which has been preserved. And uh, that has really become important for us as we begin to understand more and more the rich archaeology of the area. So why don't we, because it's about 3.20, why don't I halt my commentary and we go to any questions anybody might have. Uh, Karen McCammon, always delighted to have you with us. Uh, her question is, I always thought those stakes in the water had to do with some sort of a dog or horse track. Let me go ahead and hit this and see what else either... I can't really see more, but uh, Karen, it's interesting. The city of Miami Beach back in the mid 60s wanted to acquire, it's part of, within the borders of Miami Beach, but they wanted to develop the property. And it was rejected by the county of that effort. Uh, they wanted to build like an amusement park in that area. But to the very best of my knowledge, uh, there wasn't anything uh, re related to either a horse or, or dog track in that area. Um, and then somebody's asked, um, I'm not sure who it is, uh, is it Lawrence? Wasn't the Broad Causeway toll supposed to be stopped after it was paid off? Lawrence, I'm going to answer that question with an uh, anecdote. The Rickenbacker Causeway toll, which started at, if you can imagine this, 25 cents, and then was reduced to 10, then went up to 25 cents, with the promise that once the bonds were paid off, about $5.5 million in bonds to build the Rickenbacker Causeway, which was completed in 1947, once they were paid off, there would be no toll. Last time I looked, the toll on the Rickenbacker Causeway is probably $2.25. So I'd like to think uh, there'd be free tolls there, but um, unfortunately that hasn't happened. And then Laney says, is the Surfside Burial Ground protected somewhere? Laney, it is protected. Uh, development is away from there. I've only driven by there. I haven't really gotten out, but it is set aside as something like a park area. It'd be on the southwest part of Surfside. Uh, not too far from where you would take that two-lane causeway from Surfside over to Indian Creek Village. Um, are there any other questions anybody might have? You're very welcome, Karen, um, about this very interesting area. Hi, Sarah. Let's see. Um, well, I'll tell you what. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, Selma mentions that she went on one of those boat tours years ago in the 1990s, and the boat tours are really interesting. You know, we did a, a tour History of Miami, leaving again from uh, is it Pelican Harbor on the 79th Street Causeway, the JFK Causeway. We did a tour at night one time. It was about maybe two years ago or so. And it was absolutely amazing coming down the Indian Creek. The Indian Creek is a waterway that's moving southeast off of Biscayne Bay. And I want to mention that to you because Indian Creek had a crocodile hole where they found a crocodile that weighed upwards of about 1,000 pounds, and it ended up in the Smithsonian. This is in the late 19th century. Ralph Monroe, with his ever-present brownie camera, actually photographed uh, that crocodile. So uh, there, there's just so much up there in, in the North Bay, and I'm so eager and anxious uh, once we can get back to business and get back to touring to be able to take a group out there. But I want to thank you all so much for joining me today. We are going to be discussing on Friday Overtown. Some of the very earliest articles that I published as a historian just coming out of graduate school in the late 1970s uh, were dealt with uh, Overtown and appeared in um, issues of the Florida Historical Quarterly. So 
it's a community that I've had a very, very deep interest in for a long period of time. Historically, it's, um, it's just an absolutely amazing history. And I hope you all will join us and, um, and also take a look at some of the other offerings online uh, from History of Miami because we're putting out a lot of good stuff these days. Hope to see you soon. Thanks so much for tuning in. I appreciate it. Bye-bye now.